Alright, let's just try it. Okay. Hi. Hi. Welcome to a Documentary Podcast, uh, where we come up with very creative, uh, punny names. That's correct. <laughs> All right, so yeah, this is our first episode of the Documentary Podcast. My name is Josh. And I'm Catherine. And yeah, let's tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, and I have other podcasts, and based out of Denver, Colorado. And it's not really that interesting, but... I'd say there's some interesting stuff. <laughs> Do you want to like elaborate on your filmmaking? Because I feel like in a city like Denver, the first question I always get is like, what sort of filmmaking do you do? Because we're not in one of those like central cities. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think as far as filmmaking goes, up until like recently, I've mostly just made very no budget, minimalist relationship movies that yeah they just kind of deal with humanity i try not to move the camera a lot i'm very inspired by ozu who we've been talking about before we started recording (laughs) who we love um and i've dipped my toe into like commercial filmmaking and stuff but it's really hard for me (laughs) because i really really hate it um i understand yeah (laughs) So right now I'm just kind of really exploring documentary. Uh, I've always loved documentary. I, for some reason, have never like dived into actually making one. Um, But that's all going to change this year. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to start this podcast is just to get that motivation going to actually like get on the ground and start shooting. I have a few ideas. Um... That I'm sure people will find out about as we continue the podcast. So, yeah. So I'll say that's where I'm at right now. Cool. Yeah, what about you? Um, I'd say I'm a filmmaker as well in a very kind of put-together way right now. So I finished film school last spring, and I'm kind of delving into every sort of aspect of filmmaking to sort of figure out what I like best, and then not being picky because that's how I'm making money right now, and Unfortunately, that usually means commercial work. So that's kind of where it's at right now. But end all goal is to just be working on documentaries. Yeah. That really like showcase humanity and like explore other cultures, long studies of places. So yeah. yeah. What is it about documentary that attracts you to it? I think there's like the, I don't know if this has been said before, but kind of like that cliche quote that I think real life is more interesting than anything you can come up with. Yeah. Um, And I think what also draws me to it as well as like I love to travel I love to put myself in in like new uncomfortable situations and I feel like that's what documentary is it's like going somewhere figuring out sort of why people are the way they are or why different societies operate how they are there's a really good point to be made there because I know we were making our first feature film like four years ago or something and I was writing it specifically about this relationship that I was in and there were times where I really was like, I can't put this in a narrative. This is ridiculous. Like nobody will believe this actually happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And sometimes like one of my favorite things about documentaries is you're just like, when you're watching it, it does blur that line sometimes where you're like, okay, so how did they capture this? Mm -hmm. Or like, how real is it? Cause I will say, I think documentary is way more biased and way more manipulative than oh, narrative course. is Definitely. which can get really sketchy and really unfair I think sometimes but like you're saying yeah the more I think I open myself up and the more I travel like those experiences that I've had and I'm like this is insane like what else is out there and I think that's what film needs to do is like bring that to people who maybe aren't as willing to like expose themselves to new experiences and things other than themselves yeah i think that's a really good point oh yeah so next up in our little notes here we have our what have we been watching section so i'm gonna change that i think already to like what have we been consuming (laughs) or what have we been reading or watching or something like that okay because i do want to bring up this book um 
that I just let you borrow. You haven't read it yet. It's on the but list for the week. It's called Speaking Truth with Films by Bill Nichols. Evidence, ethics, politics, and documentary. And he dives a lot into that, like how much influence a filmmaker really has. And I find that all interesting coming from like a more narrative background because part of my narrative films that I try to do is trying to make them feel as real as possible. And I don't like to use scripts. And I think that's what it is attracting me to making documentaries so much is because in some ways I already feel like I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just controlling the story maybe a little more. But where's that line, you know? And that's what this book really dives into. Like, like what is acceptable in a documentary? Like, if you're using found footage that is to represent a certain time. Like, I just, I don't know. I think that's part of the reason, another reason why I wanted to do this podcast is treating documentary like cinema. Well, it is. This is always my biggest frustration is I think when people are like, oh, documentary is boring or like, it's not for me. It's like, well, you haven't seen the right documentaries yet because there's so much parallel between my favorite narrative films and my favorite documentary films. Like I've never ruled out in the end making narrative films because I'm like ones that are super realist about humanity, super simple, like the place is a character. Those are great. And like that, the same can be said about documentary. Similar to the films I think we're going to start talking about here, because documentaries are films as well, that they employ so oh, so much of the same like cinematic techniques that narrative films do. So like you can talk about the cinematography, you can talk about the editing, you can talk about the sound in the same way you would a narrative film, because like good ones use that for their storytelling. Yeah, I personally just want a documentary of only drone shots, uh, made by YouTube bros. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding oh i thought you were serious oh, no. i was like oh, no, no, okay no, no, no. where are you going with this no it's uh no it's interesting because i feel like it's because filmmaking and documentary just in general there's so much technology out there there's so many things you can do with the camera my interest lies right now is like how little can you do? <laughs> hmm. But I like similarly with anything I think related to design or art, this, the more simple, the more challenging it is. Oh yeah. Cause yeah, you yeah. have to have it like so precise. It has to make sense. And as much the same, I love that style, but I've realized like that is, it's so hard to accomplish. And so that's why I have so much respect for like filmmakers who do so little because you know, they're doing so much or they're just like insanely smart. All right. For sure. I think, I mean, again, uh, we were talking about Ozu, and he's a narrative filmmaker, you know, but his films are deceptively simple, Mm -hmm. and if you're not paying attention, it could seem like they were incredibly boring, (laughs) but if you really connect with it, and you connect with the people that are on the screen, and with the way the film unfolds, there's so much to be learned and experienced in there that it's just beautiful to me Mm -hmm. um well in as much as like the look may seem a bit simple like his films are about relationships and family and the history and the complexity of that and I think that's why I love Danish cinema so much as well is that there's nothing more complex in relationships so it's like you don't need all this other stuff going on when you're talking about how people get along because that's just Something I think as humans will never even understand. Oh, absolutely. So that kind of goes into this again of what I've been watching because um, last week I got to go see the new documentary by Gary Hustwit, who directed what he called the Design Trilogy, which are documentaries about different aspects of design. Uh, one of them is Helvetica and the others are objectified and urbanized. They each kind of cover different aspects of design. And this newest film is about Dieter Rams, and it's just called Rams. He was a designer kind of mid-century for Braun in Germany. And his motto in design is less but better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it was just such a beautiful film. So I definitely like suggest maybe we'll do a whole episode about it or 
you know, try to interview Gary or something. Um, Is that available for streaming yet? Because that's good. That's an issue, I think, going forward, we're going to encounter where it's like, unfortunately, documentaries come to the screen for a day or two, if you're lucky. And then it's like that hold off period to like, is it going to be on a streaming site? Totally. It will be actually very soon. I just got an email update about it. Um, I think definitely when this podcast is out, it will be out on GaryHustwit.com. Um, yeah. What have you been watching? Um, unfortunately not as many documentaries as I would have wanted to. I'm the type of person right now where I kind of have to be in a theater to watch stuff. So it's sort of whatever's playing is what I'm going to see. So I've seen quite a bit lately. Um, one documentary was Free Solo, the one about um, Alex Honnold. Oh, is yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that one. But I'd say I actually really enjoyed it. It wasn't yeah. what I expected. Um, I'm super into the outdoors and skiing, and I go see as many like outdoor films as possible. But I think those often give you like a false illusion of, I can do this. Like I watched the film, now I can go do a double backflip off a cliff, which is not <laughs> true, where this one really got into his psyche and understanding like how much work he puts in and like how he's just such a different person, maybe wired a bit differently. Um, so I'd recommend that. I think it's like one of the highest grossing documentaries ever in theaters. Wow. Like it's still at the Mayan if you live in Denver. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So free solo. And then Go I check saw, that out. I need to check that yeah, out. Yeah, it's so. really it's worth seeing. I think what I always say to people is like you don't have to be into like outdoor sports to watch those films because a lot of them are just about like people overcoming obstacles, which we all kind of have to go through. Absolutely. Um, and then I've been seeing a lot of narrative stuff. So I saw, um, what's it called? Wildlife, Paul Dano's new oh, film. Oh, yeah. How was that? Don't recommend it. No? No. Oh. He's one of the greatest actors, and I was like oh, yeah. super excited to see what he did. I think it's a really good first attempt. Like, I shouldn't be saying this because I feel bad because I'm not like, haven't made a feature before. But I think it's a good first attempt, but there was a lot of stuff not fully realized it just i didn't get the point of it sort of thing unfortunately well let's talk i mean most film critics aren't filmmakers true yeah (laughs) that is true (laughs) and it's hard as a filmmaker to be critical sometimes of filmmakers yeah because you realize how challenging it is and how easy it is for things to not turn out how you wanted them to absolutely Um, um but one really good one i saw was the favorite um oh the Oh, what's his name? He it's did a... Uh, Lan- Do- Lanthmos? Yes. Yorgos... I don't know how to pronounce a Greek name, but yeah. I love his We're gonna films. going to be really bad at pronouncing yes. names in this podcast, so just get used to it. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. Um, but it's... I love everything he does. I wasn't as, as much of a fan of The Killing of a Sacred Deer, his last film. I still haven't watched that one, but I've seen all of his other ones. But I love how he just turn Like, yeah, it's all about people and sort of their connections and just like putting everyone in very bizarre situations to point out like what's wrong with society and this one I thought was incredible he didn't write it like his last ones but it was one of the few films like I walked away from thinking and like being like oh what is this about like and nice. then it like stayed with me for a couple of days so that's great yeah I just watched um this one film it just had a huge impact on me and it's called Bobby Jean and it's about this dancer living in Israel and she wants to move back to America. She's from the Midwest. Um, and she was living in Israel for like 10 years, decided she wanted to move back to the U S leave her company that she was dancing with and kind of leave back all this, like kind of credibility and like a small level of fame that she got like dancing in Israel and move back to the U.S. and almost, like, start over, where, like, nobody really knew who she was, and she also had to leave her boyfriend behind and, like, all this stuff. And it was just one of the most personal and beautiful documentaries, like, I've ever seen. Like, the filmmaking itself wasn't incredibly, like, groundbreaking or anything, Um but it was just the access and the story and the people and everything just like stripped back. And you could tell that it was just that filmmaker like there by herself. And I think that that like really served that story really well. Um, So I definitely suggest that. And another one I'm going to shout out in this little section is uh, the birth of sake. 
It's almost like the opposite of Bobby Jean. It's about a sake brewery in Japan. And they are one of the few that still like uses old methods of making their sake. And filmmaking wise, it's insanely gorgeous. Like the camera movements, the everything down to like the typography. It was like nearly perfection, I thought. But it doesn't like um it doesn't like youtubeify the story like it doesn't like <laughs> you know what i mean it's not distracting yeah. like you still get a sense of who these people are and you get really interesting insights into these people's lives outside of work cuz basically they go to work 6 months out of the year and they just work for 6 months they sleep at the brewery they is it a brewery is that what you call it i don't even know uh the sake, say, like, sake house, the sake making wrong place, as well. <laughs> but it's incredibly beautiful. So I think that one's on Netflix, is and Bobby of, Jean is also on Netflix. So is it kind of like um, Juro Dreams of Sushi, but like the alcoholic version of it? I would say or, it's a little. It's different. Okay, it has a different feel to it. It's a lot. I feel like the filmmaking is very intentional, but you're kind of getting a wide view of of the people in the documentary. Okay. And I don't think there's any sit down interviews. I'm not sure though. Okay. Like I'm kind of like thinking back on it and I don't remember there being any. Yeah. And I think that that's interesting cause I can't really remember. I just felt like I was living in this like brewery with Oh, that's with always them. awesome when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> where you feel like, see that's what I said earlier. Like documentaries make it feel like you're traveling. Like as someone who hasn't traveled as much as they wanted to lately. It's like, yeah. Watch that. You're kind of in Japan. Right. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say I have one more to recommend that actually, like, yeah, I'd say it's pretty good. It was was um, Monrovia, Indiana, Weissman's new documentary. Yes. He's, like, would be my favorite documentary filmmaker right now. And he does a study of, like, a small, very religious town in Indiana. It's sort of like Trump's America. And I think he went into it with the idea of, like, I want to understand these people. And from someone who is so far from that community i think it was gave me a really good understanding of what it's like to be there the project that i want to work on is kind of like i want to kind of do that similar thing Mm -hmm. with my hometown um but yeah which is also inspired by chantal ackerman who is one of yeah yeah, i love her Our main film we are talking about tonight, or whenever you're listening to this, maybe it's morning for you. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe uh, you're not listening to this podcast because you haven't heard of it. Um, That's fine. So we're talking about The Departure. So The Departure, which was made by Elena Wilson in 2017, um, it's her second feature. Um, If you haven't seen her other one, her first one is... After Tiller, which is intense. It's very good, though. Maybe we'll talk about that one on the later one. Yeah. Um, But it follows a Buddhist monk um, who is dealing with sort of the suicide crisis in Japan right now. Um, And yeah, it's a very, I wouldn't say it's like fully verite style, but it sort of just follows him and sort of the, the complexity that it brings to his life and his relationships with his family and sort of the truth he's seeking out that he doesn't really ever figure out. The interesting thing about this film is because it is so simple, but there's just so much there because he is dealing with people that are struggling with suicide and he's basically trying to like show them why life is worth living. And at the same time, he's dealing with his illness. And I don't think that's a spoiler because I'm pretty sure it's in the description. And I think it comes up within like the first 20 minutes. And it's, I think, obvious if someone is dealing consistently with people who are suicidal or depressed, it's going to affect them in one way or another. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because he's dealing with so much in his life and the compassion of this guy, like just through how he talks to people and stuff. And he's so blunt with them. Well, it starts and ends with a death ceremony of sorts. And it's really, 
when I when it first started, I was like, oh wow, this is going to be incredibly intense. But like you were saying, yeah. this is a bit of like a sidetrack. But what you were saying earlier, um, I think I may have gotten cut off, but how it's shot so simply and it mm-hmm. appears so simply, and I think that was really important Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many moments of quietness, so many like moments for you to contemplate what's going on because it is such a serious subject or one that really hits you emotionally, like not just for the protagonist, but also for like the people he's helping and his family. Like everyone is going through so much emotionally that you need those like pauses and like the just almost like informality of the film to kind of let it keep on moving. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because there are all these kind of transitional elements with him like at a club like dancing mm-hmm. or like and I think it just does a really good job at capturing those quiet moments in life and how those can help you with the more intense stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that that kind of maybe comes directly from him being a Buddhist, you know, being yeah. very meditative, like, like kind of trying to live in the moment and be compassionate and have that like kindness you know Mm -hmm. just kind of exude from you yeah Um, i do very much agree with that that i think the shooting style was so purposeful and so beautiful because yeah it did i didn't think of that but it does have that sort of like buddhist quality a bit to it but i almost thought the silences were like a bit different actually i thought the transitions were important but I think with a lot of the people here, what he's providing as help for their depression or suicidal thoughts is community and a way to talk. And I think normally people, it's just a generalization of for personal experiences, you suffer internally and you suffer quietly. So I almost saw those moments as like kind of how the culture is experiencing all this, because it is true that Japan has an issue with suicide. Um, to the point where I was reading a New Yorker article and they're like, it's no longer a, like a psychological or psychiatric issue. It's an anthropological issue now. And so it felt like it was creating this atmosphere of like quietness and stillness. And in one aspect was very beautiful, but on the other, there was all this like silent suffering going on. Mm. Yeah, I think I could definitely, like now that you say that, I was definitely like feeling that in the moment, but I don't think it registered consciously to me. Um yeah, I think that's a really good insight into that because, well, and the funny thing is, is there is a grandfather in this movie who basically just says it bluntly out loud. Like, you couldn't have written a scene that was more perfect to explain what you just explained. Um, I won't go too much into it because I don't want to, I don't know. Like, how much do we have to worry about spoilers with documentary? I think, no, I think <laughs> but, that's fair. But I think with this one, if anyone's listening who has dealt with this or, like, dealt with these sort of issues or knows people who have, I think that relationship between the grandfather and the granddaughter yeah. is something that's quite universal where absolutely maybe an older generation or someone who's less empathetic is like, why don't you just get it together? Our generation works hard. Like, why are you sad? Like, just figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um and I don't think that's spoiling too no, much. No, no, no. Because it's, yeah. Well, I think that, because there is that moment, and this is something I've experienced, like being someone who is in therapy, you know, who deals with depression and stuff, like older generations, even in America, you know, it's the same. They don't talk about it, mm-hmm. you know? And the grandpa literally says, oh, we just deal with this quietly. I don't know why you have to talk to this man. Yeah. You know? And I think that that, like, perfectly, like, summarizes the change in culture that we're experiencing, like, worldwide. Like, it's not just a Japanese thing, you know? Yeah. Um, Maybe that in this film is a little bit more of an extreme example than I've experienced, but... Wait, in what way? When you said... Yeah. What example? Like, do you Uh, want to elaborate on that? Well, just, like... Like, I told my mom, you know, that I was in therapy and, you know, she's like, she gets all worried. Like, are you okay? You know? And I'm like, yeah, it's just like being proactive, you know, just trying to work on, (laughs) you know, being a calmer, Mm -hmm. happier person, you know? Um, And I think that it's generational. Yeah. It's cultural, but it's not, 
And I think that's what I loved about this film because it is very Japanese, mm-hmm. but it's universal. Yeah. You know, all the themes in there. And I think, yeah, a lot of it, what I got was like the sense of community and how you hear studies everywhere where it's like, especially our generation, we, whether it's technology or how we're living, I don't think there's one thing to blame, but a lot of people go through spurts of depression, whether it's like their entire lives or a bit, because I think we are so isolated. Um, And it was so interesting a lot of the times when, is it Nomoto? Is that Mm -hmm. how you pronounce it? Yeah. When Nomoto would talk with someone, it was so interesting. He he consistently, you can see what he he endures through the film because he gets texts and calls from all the people he works with. Um, But they start off like so upset and within like a, five minute conversation it may have been edited down you can just like hear the tone in their voice or like they have hope and it's all just because of an interaction with another person and that was one of my I think biggest takeaways is that we actually didn't see a lot of death in the film what we mainly saw was like people coming together in connections and I feel like as much as it's a very like bookended film and we don't get a lot of answers throughout the one thing I think that was consistent for me at least what I walked away with was that like by connecting with others, that is one thing that provides hope amongst all this like darkness. Yeah, and I think that is an important point about not really getting much answers either because I think the film doesn't give us clean answers and he doesn't give the people he talks to clean answers because there are none, Yeah, you know? It's just like this is just life and it's messy and it's heartbreaking and... Like the, what's so beautiful about the film and just this person in general is just recognizing that connection is really kind of at the heart of everything, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's just such a beautiful thing to explore in film. And yeah, that's just one of the things I just really loved about it. Yeah, I love films that, like, pose more questions than have answers. And, like, speaking of that, there's actually, I wrote this quote down at the end because I was like, what is this about? And that's sort of the thing is, like, what is it about? And when he's having, he has a conversation at the end with someone who was affected by suicide. And I think, what did she say? She says, um, it's okay to not have the answers um, as long as you keep asking questions. And, like, Mm. she actually tells that to the monk. And I feel like his path is like searching out why are people doing this because as much as he's being affected I don't think he's someone who was suicidal at all and but has been affected by it and when he I think gets that answer it's kind of a bit of closure in that way that it, we're never as people are going to understand unless you're one of those people why people want to end their lives like yeah absolutely I love that quote there it's so funny because like there are such intense like universal themes throughout this but it's done in such like I just feel like the thing I liked about the filmmaking is that I feel like it represented his I don't know I just feel like the way it was conveyed the way the story unfolds and everything just felt like the way he I don't even know how to articulate it Almost like the way that you seem feel like maybe he experiences life a yeah, little no, bit. It's, it's almost him realizing how he experienced. I think it's a bit meta in that oh, yeah, way yeah, too. Yeah. Like he's figuring out why he is the way he is a bit, or like mm-hmm. coming to terms with is his, if he's willing to let what he wants to do sacrifice other important things in his life. Like that last ceremony he has, kind of like oh boy, this is intense. Like when he what he's willing to give up to help other people. And in the way, I think he actually is killing. Like, yeah, I don't know if that gives it away again once, but like, I think he is realizing he himself is basically, you don't say like going through suicide, but in a way doing that. Yeah, it's like how much of yourself can you give? And I think that's why you need to like give to yourself a little bit. But I think that's why he connects so well with the people is because he's actually gone through that. Like one, becoming a monk because you kind of have to give up everything. And then by doing the work he does, he's giving up everything else as well. And that's, he goes through these um, like ceremonies where he kind of asks the people like, what are you willing to give up? Or like, what do you want to hold on to? And that's what he does throughout his entire life. So there's, I think a lot of parallels with that. Absolutely. What did you think about the filmmaking in general? I would say I was like 90% 90 on board with it. I love like 
natural i guess in documentary you almost always have natural lighting unless yeah. you're doing interviews but i love like the cool tones and like the long shots and the, mm-hmm. i love following shots i actually hate seeing people's faces in film because i think your surrounding says way more about what's going on than the actual person um but my one thing is interesting because when winders who you mentioned he said my film, idol. he said film is faces <laughs> wait no really but his films don't show that i thought like for me like vendors is not about the care like his, his, it's the place i think dictates way more than the characters interesting wait he's oh this is gonna change a lot now um <laughs> but not actually no Still, i totally like, i get what you say what you're saying though like i don't necessarily need um a film to some people can do it errol morris can like oh, just yeah. be on somebody talking directly to the camera and like it's interesting and stuff. But generally, I prefer a film like this that is yeah. more on the verite side. Um, it broke it a bit, and it I think did. that's where in the middle it breaks it. And they do a sit down interview, and I was like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. Because that might have been my least favorite part of the film. We too. didn't need his history, yeah, at all. I don't think it had anything to do with the film, like. Mm-hmm. With That's, his journey. Yeah, you don't really need that context yeah. a lot of times. Like, sometimes I think it can serve a film. But for this, I feel like we were kind of getting a glimpse into his current situation. Mm-hmm. Like, what he's going through now. And it felt more immediate. Like, kind of similar to the multiple experiences of the phone calls he gets throughout the movie yeah. and stuff. Like, it's very immediate. So kind of like taking that detour. Um, it, yeah, it was a detour that yeah. was sort of kind of threw you off. Because it's a very like tonal, moody piece in mm-hmm. a way. And I felt like it almost reminded me of, um, oh, like the big doc. He does Vietnam, all that oh, stuff. Oh, Ken Burns. It's like, it almost had like a, <laughs> this is terrible, I should have known that. But like a Ken Burns effect. Because it yeah. had like him sitting in narration and like photographs. And I was like, yeah. that I think filmmaking does stand a purpose. Like you're saying about Errol Morris. And it, if it fits the story and the subject and that sort of theme. But this was just sort of, yeah, like it just mm-hmm. didn't. Like I love, I love a Ken Burns film, don't get yeah. me wrong. But it just didn't fit in the middle of this Ken film. Burn, yeah. It was like the Maisel Brothers or something like randomly if like halfway through a film they just put in like i don't know just it is there would there would just be more interesting but it didn't ruin the film for me no um but yeah it definitely did feel like a little bit of a detour like halfway through but i would definitely say people should go watch this film i'd say (laughs) yes definitely watch it i think the hard thing for me as well was that it's a character study and i like i was saying earlier how much i love place it took me a second to sort of like buy into it because for me character studies aren't as fascinating but i'd say i definitely would recommend it it's very heavy and if you deal with like depression or suicide just Mm. like be prepared that it puts you in a mindset where like or just be ready to go into that mindset because it's very I wouldn't say like a warning, but like it took me a second to shake after I watched it. Yeah, it's definitely one of those films. Um, If you do want to watch it, it is available on Amazon Prime at the moment. Um, Two thumbs up. Just kidding. (laughs) I know, really. This is when I'm not clever. Um, Let's see. What our rating system should be watch it, don't watch it, or. Yeah, it, our title's simple, so I think it should be a watch it or don't watch it. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, as long we as... We just figured this out. I'm going to yeah. leave this part in the podcast. Okay. This is the behind the scenes. BTS. Which is basically <laughs> what the whole podcast is going to be. <laughs> yeah, so I will... Then I will give my rating, watch it. I'll say watch it. It's beautiful. The beautiful movie. It is beautiful, and it... Yeah. All right, so that was... The Departure. Again, it's available on Amazon Prime. And Catherine is here with some supplements. Yes, if you want some supplemental reading, as we talked about earlier, it doesn't really delve into the history of the monk who it's about. So there's a great New Yorker article. I think it's just titled um, The Departure. And it goes into his history and actually just about like becoming a monk in Japan right now. It's great. And it was written by Larissa. Here's another horrible pronunciation. Um, Mick... Farrell? It's M-A-C-F-A-R-A. 
H A R. Um, a great article to read. Um, yeah. And it just provides more insight into the protagonist. Great, so go check that out. And on the next episode, we will be talking about when lambs become lions. Go to a documentarypodcast.com. Visit us on Instagram at a documentary podcast. You can find me on Instagram at Joshua Labure. And you can find me at CMS Moments. All right. That does it for this episode. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Thanks. <laughs> I think that's good.